Now, please, will you open your Bibles to Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians, and uh, looking at just the first two verses of chapter 1, particularly verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother to the church of God which is at Corinth to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours Verse 2, the church of God, which is at Corinth. I see, first of all, a church established. I see that in the word is. The church of God, which is at Corinth. Paul writes then to this church, established by Paul himself in uh, the course of his second missionary journey he visited Corinth in March AD 50 during the course of his second missionary journey and a church had been established in Corinth. Corinth was one of the great cities of New Testament days. It was the capital city of the Roman province of Achaia. It was situated on a narrow strip of land which was just four miles wide. And this narrow strip of land linked the southern part of Greece with the rest of the country. Corinth was a strategic centre, both of commerce and trade, both by land and sea. Now, we read the details of Paul's visit to Corinth in Acts 18. Let me remind you of some of those details. When Paul arrived in Corinth from Athens, he met a Jewish couple there, Aquila and his wife Priscilla. They had recently arrived in Corinth from Rome. The, there'd been a riot in Rome uh, instigated by the Jews, and so the Roman Emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome. Get the troublemakers out. And uh, two of those uh, Jews were Aquila and Priscilla, and they came from Rome and settled in Corinth. Now, this couple and Paul shared the same occupation. They were tent makers. And so Paul went to stay with them and to work with them. Now, Luke tells us in Acts 18 that every Sabbath day, in the local Jewish synagogue, Paul had reasoned. That's the word that Luke uses. He had reasoned with both Jews and Greeks that Jesus was the Christ or the Messiah. Most of the Jews rejected that, of course. And when they refused to accept Paul's message, he left the synagogue and told them that he had discharged his responsibilities towards them. Your blood, he said, be on your own heads. I'm now turning to the Gentiles. And so he went right next door to open up his own meeting. That was quite a possibly provocative thing for Paul to have done, don't you think? Fancy if... Some of your congregation left here and opened up right next door. Well, that's what Paul did. He went and opened up a meeting in the home of a man called Titius Justus. Now, Luke describes him as a worshipper of God. That doesn't just mean he worshipped God. The title worshipper of God uh, is a technical term. Luke mentions this group of people, worshippers of God, or God-fearers, 
He worships them on a number, uh, mentions them on a number of occasions in the Acts of the Apostles. One of them, of course, one God-fearer, was Cornelius. Uh, we are told he feared God. Now, they were Gentiles, and yet they attended the Jewish synagogue. Now, why would Gentiles attend a Jewish synagogue? Well, because they had become disillusioned. First of all, with Gentile religion, because the Greeks and the Romans, as you know, had many gods and goddesses. These people had become sickened with that, and they were attracted to the Jewish faith, because the Jews believed in one God, Yahweh or Jehovah. These people were also disillusioned with the sexual immorality which was connected with the worship of the pagan gods in Gentile temples. They were sickened of that too, of the immorality associated with the worship. And they were attracted to the worship of, of Jehovah, uh, to the, uh, the worship of of this God who was holy and depend, uh, um, demanded ho holiness and godliness among those who worshipped him. So here were these Gentiles attracted to the Jewish faith. They attended the synagogue, but of course they had to sit apart from the Jews. Now if you read the Acts of the Apostles, you will discover that in almost every city after city that Paul visited he went straight to the synagogue that was always his, his missionary strategy we'll go to the Jews in the synagogue first and uh, these God fearers, these worshippers of God who were, who were Gentiles but attended the synagogue time after time you find that they readily accepted the gospel they believed uh, in Paul's message. You see, they were seekers, weren't they? They were looking for truth. But they had not found it in the synagogue. But when Paul comes preaching Jesus Christ uh, as, uh, as their saviour, they were well prepared. The soil of their hearts had been prepared by the Spirit and they readily accepted the gospel. Luke tells us many Corinthians believed and they were baptised. And one of them, of course, was the leader of the synagogue, Crispus. Now, what a trophy of grace he must have been. The very leader of the synagogue accepts Christ. If you read Acts 18, verse 17, you discover he was replaced by a man called Sosthenes. Now, will you look at verse 1, please, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? Who do we see there? Sosthenes. Crispus is converted. He's replaced by Sosthenes. He believes and is converted. The Lord did a good work there, didn't he, in Corinth. Paul stayed there for about 18 months teaching the scriptures to the new believers in this newly established church. So a church had been established in Corinth. Now that was very remarkable when you consider the kind of city Corinth was. First of all, it was a prosperous city. A, a city of commerce and trade. Many of the inhabitants of Corinth lacked nothing materially. They were well off. Now we know uh, it's a principle in life that people who are well off uh, are financially secure. They feel that they lack nothing materially and they see no need of Christ. They say, I have everything I need. Possessions and money are their gods. And that was true of Corinth, a prosperous city. 
It was also a proud city. Now we know something about the Greeks, of course, that they loved philosophers, poets, and orators. Paul says, in fact, in verse 22 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that they loved wisdom. Now then, in 1969, I went to Cardiff University. Now that's dating me a bit, isn't it? 1969. Uh, I went to study Hebrew, biblical studies, but we had to do a third subject in the first year, and I chose philosophy. How I passed the exams, I, I never know. I never understood a word of it, because I don't have that sort of mind. But somehow I scraped through, and then for the other two years, got concentrated on Hebrew, New Testament, Greek, uh, and biblical studies, and, and got through with a degree. But the Greeks loved wisdom, philosophy, poetry, oratory. You remember at Athens, Paul went to debate the gospel with philosophers, the Stoics and the Epicureans. Didn't get him very far, you know, because when he mentioned Jesus and the resurrection, the, the word in the Greek suggests that they burst out laughing. They laughed in his face. Nonsense, Paul. And he comes to Corinth, doesn't he? And he says, I came in much fear. And, and trembling. His confidence had been rather knocked at Athens, but he comes now trusting in the gospel. It was also a polluted city. Now, we think today, and I think it's true, we live in a pre pretty morally corrupt society, don't we? And almost any perversion and vice is accepted today as normal. Corinth was a city like that. There were many shrines and temples dedicated to the worship of various gods and goddesses. Now, an integral part of pagan temple worship was sexual immorality. I don't know whether any of you here have ever been to, to Corinth, but the city was dominated by a hill called the Acro Corinth. And on the summit of this hill, it was 1,850 feet high, very high, on top of the hill stood a large temple dedicated to the Greek goddess Aphrodite. She was the goddess of love and fertility. 1,000, I repeat that, 1,000 so-called sacred prostitutes were part of the worship of Aphrodite in the temple in Corinth. And every night they came down into the streets of Corinth, as we would say today, looking for business. Immoral sexual activity was said to please Aphrodite. In the city itself stood another temple dedicated to Apollo, the god of music, song, and poetry. In the temple of Apollo, nude statues of Apollo aroused male worshippers into homosexual activity with the long-haired male prostitutes. Corinth was as some commentator has said, a moral cesspit. It was a moral sewer. Now that's the city that Paul came to preaching the gospel. Leon Morris says in his commentary, the city to which Paul came preaching the gospel was an important city. Intellectually alert, materially prosperous, and morally corrupt. Can I suggest to you this morning that humanly speaking, and I repeat that, humanly speaking, there was not much prospect for gospel success in Corinth, was there? 
And yet a church was established in pagan Corinth. How do you account then for the success of the gospel in a city like Corinth? I suggest two reasons at least. And the first is this. The power that there is in the gospel message to change godless lives. In uh, chapter 2, Paul reminds the Corinthians that when he had first visited them, he says, look, I didn't rely on wisdom or eloquence of speech. He says, I put my trust in the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that resulted in a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And we read that the lives of many in Corinth had been transformed by the power of the gospel. In chapter 6 of the first letter, verses 9 to 11, Paul lists a, a whole um, a list, a huge list, of those who will not inherit the kingdom. Uh, and let me read that list out to you. Now, listen to this. The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexual offenders, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers. And then Paul adds these remarkable words, and that is what some of you were. And there's that lovely word, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. I, I suggest to you that if you wanted to start a church today, you, you wouldn't think of people like this, would you? You'd want rather respect to people, don't you think? Like Mr. Morley and people like this, you know. You wouldn't have gone for this lot, would you? But they were changed. And many of these people were now sitting in the church in Corinth. So that's why the gospel was successful, because God demonstrated his power uh, in the preaching of the word. But there's a second uh, um, reason, I think, for the success of the gospel, and we love this. In eternity past, God had chosen or elected those whom he would save in Corinth. We read in Acts 18, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Because I have many people in this city. They hadn't yet believed, of course. They hadn't yet heard the gospel. But Paul was told by the Lord, they will believe. Because I've chosen them. Jesus said, I will build my church. And Noah, not even Satan himself, can prevent its being built. So there we have it then, a church established. Now in verse 2, we have a church described. And Paul tells us five things about the church at Corinth. And it applies to every other gathering of God's people. It applies to this church here. So the first thing he says in verse 2 is that they are an assembly of God's people. He writes to the church. Now, that's the Greek word ecclesia. It speaks of an assembly, a gathering of people. Among the Greeks, it was used to describe an assembly of the citizens of a town that gather together to discuss some matter of business. Paul uses that word and applies it to the company of God's people. So the local church is the assembled or the gathered people of God. That is what we are this morning here. We are the people of God gathered. Did not Jesus say where two or three are gathered together in my name, 
I am there in the midst of them. So the local church gathers or assembles for spiritual purposes. We've come this morning to pray. To hear God's word read and expounded. To praise and thank the Lord for all his blessings. The, 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 the noun that is translated assembly or church comes from the Greek verb meaning to call out. And the church consists of a called out people. Called out by God from a godless world to be his very own people. That's what we are today. So it's the church. It's the church of God. The church is not a human invention, is it? The church belongs to God alone. It's the church of God. In Acts 20, we read a, well, it's a, a, a heart-rending uh, account of Paul calling the elders of the church in Ephesus to meet him at Miletus. That's the last time they will see Paul alive. And you know there's the uh, uh, remarkable occasion where they all break down in, into tears at the thought of not seeing the apostle again. And he addresses them and issues them with responsibilities to, to pastor and to oversee the flock at Ephesus. He says about the, the, the church at Ephesus, he, he describes it as the flock. It's a flock of sheep, spiritual sheep. The flock, he says to these elders, of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to look out over the congregation, to, 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 to meet their needs and, and support them. To shepherd the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. That's interesting, isn't it? But it's not the Father who shed his blood, is it? It was the Son who shed his blood. So go and tell that one in the Kingdom Hall. Because it's the Son who shed his blood, but who's here referred to as God, second person of the Trinity. The church, it's of God, it's at Corinth. Now we know the church of God consists of all God's redeemed people throughout history. So a great many of the church of God this morning are in heaven. The Lord's taken them to be with him. So some of them are in heaven. The rest of us are still here on earth today. And there are some not yet born. Who one day will be belong to the church of God. And yet. At every point in human history. Today. This vast church. Is to be found in every local congregation of believers God thinks highly of the local church he thinks more highly of it sometimes than we do he has a great uh, regard for it thinks of it highly the local church is of central importance in God's purposes God works through the local church Every local church consists of the blood-bought people of God whom he's called out of the world and who gather together for spiritual purposes. So that's the first thing we understand here about the church, that it's an assembly, a gathering of God's people. It was Bishop Ryle who said, the devil has a higher regard for the church of Jesus Christ than some believers do. Because he seeks to destroy it. We should highly value it. Esteem your local church highly. Now the second thing he tells us in verse 2 uh, about the church is that it consists of those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. The word here 
means set apart. So God has called his people out of the world in order to set them apart from the world to be his very own people. So the people of God are a distinct people. They are a people separate from the people of the world. In 1 Peter 2, we read these words. These words applied, of course, in Exodus to the Jews, now applied to the church. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Now, in the uh, new, um, uh, original King James Version, of course, written in the 17th century, the word that we were brought up with years ago on the AV, uh, a peculiar people. Now, it doesn't mean peculiar, as we, though I've met some very peculiar Christians, right? but that's another issue. It means particular or, or distinct or special, and that's what we are. God has set us apart in Jesus Christ, united to Christ by faith. He set us apart to be his very own people. The challenge to us today is this, of course, how distinct are we? As we go about our business, walk around our streets, can people say of us, there's a man of God, there's a woman of God, that's the challenge. How distinct are we? The third thing that uh, we read here about the believers is that they are those whom God has called. Romans 8, those whom God foreknew, that's in eternity past, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. Those whom he predestined, he also called and he justified and glorify them. So a Christian is someone who has been called by God. And the scripture speaks about two gospel calls. There is what we call the general or external call. Now whenever the gospel is preached, God makes a sincere offer to all who hear that gospel that if they will only confess their sins, turn from them, and receive Jesus Christ as their saviour, he will pardon them. That's the call Jesus was speaking about in Matthew 22, when he says many are called. Every time the gospel is preached from this pulpit or any other pulpit, or declared in the open air, or over the media, whenever, that call is issued. It's the general call. It's issued by the one who speaks it, the one who preaches it. But there's another call, and that is called the effectual call, or the effective call. Now, that's not a general external call, that's a personal and inward call. And it's issued, yes, through the preacher, but not by the preacher. It's issued by the Lord himself. Indeed, it's more than a call. It's a divine summons. And so, because it's issued by God, it always creates in the heart of the one who hears the call a response. Some years ago, in evangelical times... I read this excellent illustration of the effectual call in an article written by Pastor Jeff Thomas, you know, um, who pastored for many years there in Aberystwyth. And uh, it concerns Jeff's uncle, Uncle Bryn, uh, his father's twin brother. And uh, one day, Uncle Bryn was travelling by train from Barnstable in North Devon to Bristol Temple Meads. He was walking along the platform while train arrivals and departures were being announced over the tannoy. Uncle Bryn, 
paid no attention to the announcements for two reasons. He already knew where he was going and he knew what time his train was departing from Barnstaple. And then he heard another announcement coming over the tannoy. Will Mr Bryn Thomas from Barnstaple please go to the station master's office? Well, Uncle Bryn heard this call. Do you know why? It was a personal call. And it was directed particularly towards him. The reason for the call was that his son had been taken ill and uh, Uncle Bryn was being asked to return home. That's an excellent illustration, isn't it, of the effectual call? Who issues this call? It's God the Father. Verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ. Now the one who receives this call responds in saving faith and without that call we remain spiritually dead and unable to respond. Do you remember the conversion of Lydia in Acts 16? The little meeting at the riverside? All the women at the riverside in Philippi that day, they heard the general call, don't you think? Issued by the Apostle Paul that day. They all heard it. But only one responded. Only one lady heard the effectual call that day, and that was Lydia. Lydia's ears heard Paul's voice, but Lydia's heart heard the Lord inwardly summoning her to faith. I once saw that uh, effectual call in action. Um, I was brought up in one of the Pentecostal denominations, the Elam Pentecostal Church. And I thank God for those many years there uh, of service. Now then, uh, in the town of Mountain Ash, I once belonged to the church there, the Elam Church, and uh, there was a very well-attended uh, ladies' meeting. They used to call it the sisterhood in those days. Well, anyway, they always had uh, an annual rally, which is quite a big thing, of course, on a Monday afternoon, then tea, and then the evening meeting. Now, what always um, uh, intrigued me was this. The men could always attend in the evening, but we were never invited in the afternoon. I think it was to keep us from the tea, you know. I'm sure it has got something to do with it. Um, so we would go along on the Monday evening, you see. But in that particular church, the only time in the year, the meeting was given over to the, the Sunday evening meeting to the ladies. Uh, and it was always conducted by the pastor's wife. And then the ladies sang and, and whatever, you see. And they always had a guest speaker for the weekend. And uh, on this particular occasion, it was a Mrs. Meadows, very good preacher, who uh, belonged to a little mission in the Gospel Valley called the Kumturch Mission. Uh, and uh, it was on the Sunday evening, I remember I was there, she preached on uh, the lost sheep who was lost in the, in the desert, in the wilderness, the lost son who was lost in the far country, and then the lost coin who was lost in the house. And the, 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 um, the, the thought that she brought out to the ladies was this, you can be lost, estranged from God, in the house of God. Now there was a lady uh, in the church, she'd... Uh, uh, started attending the church for many years. Uh, her son, who, who, who we know, had been converted and he invited his parents to, to attend the church and they did. Uh, his father was gloriously converted and then went to glory. But the mother, no, she remained hardened to the gospel, uh, rather proud, 
didn't see herself as a sinner at all and uh, could be rather awkward and feisty. I can say that now because she's gone to glory. But, you know, she was awkward and uh, someone you would rather avoid if you, if you could. But she would come every Sunday evening. She came for 15 years. And then Mrs. Meadows turned up. And Mrs. Meadows said just one sentence that spoke to this lady. And she said, you could have been sitting in this church for years. And you're lost in the house of God. At the close of the meeting, this lady who sat next to my mother said to my mother, I want to see the pastor. Well, my mother said, you can't. He's speaking to somebody now. Oh, I must see him now. Well, uh, my mother said, Doris, what's the urgency? Why, why do you want to speak to, to pastor now? Well, and do you know what this woman said? Because that preacher has told me I've been sitting here for years and I'm lost. I suggest that's the effectual call that she received that night. And she was gloriously changed. She was no longer awkward and feisty. She was one of the most delightful people you could ever get to know. She took a number of us out for a meal to celebrate her salvation and she paid for the meal herself and only just before the pandemic we met her son again in Aberdeen market and I said Lynn do you remember your mother's conversion he said I do uh, I said do you remember the meal yes I remember the meal he said I'll tell you another thing you don't know about my mother too uh, I did know she was very house proud and fussy she lived alone do you know she hoovered every day and she dusted every day. Well, it's more than I do anyway. I'm the hooverer, but I only hoover when enough pressure's put on me. And I know if I don't hoover now, there's going to be a problem here. So I'm not as good at it as I ought to be. But Doris hoovered and dusted every day. Her son said to me, do you know when she was converted? She never hoovered for a month. <laughs> do, she said, I'm far too excited now. What's happened to me? I'm not bothered about the hoovering. That's the effectual call. Have you received it, friends? Many of you have. You can look back to the day you received that call from the Lord. Then, two points very briefly to finish. Notice, in the fourthly, they were called to be saints. Now, many people have misunderstood that. They think it's a title conferred on you by the Pope. When you're alive, you've performed some miracle, perhaps. You've been especially holy people. Uh, the Virgin Mary may have appeared to you. That, that's to misunderstand. I know they're sincere in their belief, but that's to misunderstand what the, the word saint means. Every believer is a saint. Read Paul's letters. Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. They're all addressed to the saints of God which are in Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi, and so on. Saints are not dead people. They're living people that God has transformed and called to holiness. The challenge again for us today is this. We must be what our name suggests. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 as he who called you is holy, you also must be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, and he quotes from Leviticus, Be holy, God says, because I am holy. People still visit holy places, shrines and so on. Let me tell you this, friends. The teaching of the New Testament is this. There is no such thing as a holy place. The New Testament only knows about holy people. And we must be holy, godly people. Finally, fifthly, the believers at Corinth were just a small company of a very large family called to be saints together with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord.
God only has one church and he only has one family to which every believer belongs. In Revelation chapter 7, John has a remarkable vision of the saints gathered in heaven. He says, I saw a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes. That's the robe of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. All gathered together, finally at last, safely home. Friends, do you belong to this church of Jesus Christ? Are you saved? Are you washed in the blood of Jesus Christ? Have you been justified by faith? If not, I pray the Lord would, in his grace, issue to you this effectual call to salvation. So a church established and a church described. Amen.